lives are driven by information technology. Our society has been fundamentally changed by it, and our future, as unclear as it is, will be enabled by it. Your day, from start to finish, involves technology in a significant way. And that technology is in the hands and under the control of people whose drive for profit blinds them to human need. From 2017 to 2019, about 1,500 activists in the United States and Mexico came together in 25 local and regional convergences to talk about the intersection between technology and revolution. How to use it now and in the future and how to democratize it to make sure we have a future. Because the consensus was if we don't control our technology, we have no future as a human race. In intense conversations, often lasting several hours, these activists hammered out points of unity they felt our movements should adopt and work around. As the process continued, these points were refined and expanded to the eight points we are presenting today. The people who participated in Technology and Revolution proposed that your organization make these eight points part of your own strategy and your work. Let's go over them. Provide everyone with full, free, high-speed, equitable access to the internet, independent of content. Build an internet that is democratic, community-centered and governed, open, decentralized, and free of corporate pressure and monopolies. Build a political technology campaign to oppose, restrain, and ultimately eliminate surveillance. Move technology to prioritize sustainability, community thriving, climate justice, and many worlds are possible. Seek out, build, and embrace the potential of digital technologies to protect and advance our movements. Improve and deepen the collaboration and mutual education between movement technologists and other movement activists and organizations. Foster political consciousness about the centralization of technology in movement work and the urgency of revolutionary movement-based technology. Expand the technology conversation beyond settler colonial technology and thinking to be culturally relevant, intersectional, and grounded in political education and historical context. So, um, the, uh, besides demonstrating that one of the um, great accomplishments of the left is the use of commas and run-on sentences, um, th those eight points, I, I want to explain how we got to those eight points. And um, it, it requires a little bit of explanation about what May 1st is. We're an organization that's been in existence for 15 years now. We're a membership organization. That means, you know what fucking membership, you know membership is membership. But it really is membership. It's not like membership at a gym or something like that. People actually vote. People make decisions. You like the leadership. You do all those sorts of things. And we take that stuff mad seriously. So, um, and we are decidedly a, 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 a movement organization. We are of the left. We specialize in technology. We have about 850 members, most of which are organizations. Under our tent, our family is comprised of about 2,300 activists in the United States and, and uh, Mexico primarily. Um, we're one of the largest coalition organizations uh, in the world and one of the largest in in uh, this part of the world, the Americas. Um, and our work is divided between, it's not really divided, it comprises uh, sharing resource, like a provider, website, email, all that stuff, and activist work in coalitions, and, and organizing some things like the Technology and Revolution Project. Why do we do this? What, what, what exactly is it? You hear Maritza's voice explaining uh, what it is, but it may not be completely uh, clear. 
Technology and revolution is a, was a two-year, it's still going on, but it was a two-year, taking the two years that we did it, um, it seven, kind of 17 to 19, a process in which we brought together uh, in 25 convergences, local convergences, cities, particularly in the United States and some in Mexico, two in Canada, um, about 1,500 activists, left-wing activists, 1,500, to talk about the intersection between technology and revolution. That's never been done. Um, and it was a, we weren't sure what the hell was going to happen. Uh, we're not sure, and nobody can be sure what happens when you put 1,500 activists together in any kind of process, what's going to happen. Um, and the results were truly amazing, not necessarily in a posit completely positive way. They were surprising to us. Uh, why did we do this? Obviously, technology is a major force in everyone's life. It has, particularly information technology, it has redone the fabric of your existence. Not only in terms of the way you use it, but in terms of the possibilities. What you can do with the society. What that society does to you. How much of your life is in the, uh, you know, in the grasp of powerful forces. How much privacy you have or how little privacy you have. How much interaction. How great is your ability to share your personal story with billions of other people across the earth? And what does that actually mean? And most of all, the question that we keep asking is why? Why the hell right now are 3.2 billion people using this thing? What is it? What is the impetus? What has driven people? And uh, one of the things we were talking about internally in May 1st is obviously the pressure of the crisis. Uh, you're living as I have lived. I'm 70 years old. I've lived my entirety of my life in a capitalist society, in a, a system, under an economic system that has collapsed. Now, there's a lot of other people going to tell you a lot of other horsey-worsey stuff. Say, nah, it's not going to Look at the stock. Market. In the United States, man, we get to hit this. Every freaking media outlet said, the economy's doing real good because look at the stock market. Stock market's a casino. That's got nothing to do with what, the, this, what, what, what a, an economy's supposed to be about. There's a purpose that economy has. It's supposed to be to feed people and to permit us to, to, to gain sustainability in our lives. That's why we create economies. It's not doing that. Half the population of the world's dying. And here's the tip-off. Here's the tip-off. I've been, Toronto's one of my favorite cities. I, 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 and I don't actually say that in every city I talk in. I actually, it is one of my favorite cities. So I come here a couple of times a year at least, and I have been for 50 years or so. Every time I come, it's changing. And the changes, this time, you know, they're becoming more and more the presence of migrating people. And you can actually see that in this room. People who are families of migrated, of migrating people or people who are migrating themselves from other countries. Why are they doing that? Why is that happening? And there are explanations. People say gangs in, in Central America, anything. It's the breakdown of the society that sustained them. People are coming, for example, into, the, into my neighborhood in, in, in Brooklyn, New York, from Central America massively because they can't grow crops. Simply, there's nothing to eat. So there's nothing to farm. And there's nothing to farm because we have a crisis of climate with which our system cannot deal. And you've seen in, uh, you know, I mean, you don't even have to look past. I mean, obviously, we see things like Winnipeg and <laughs> Florida and uh, Houston, Houston, Texas underwater. I mean, this is unheard of, um, you know, uh, this past week. Uh, those are the manifestations in the most obvious sense. But the real impact of climate change and, and climate crisis is 
People can't eat. So they got to move. They got to constantly be moving. And the curatives that governments are offering for the climate crisis are, while important, totally inadequate. He, what they're saying is, let's stop uh, in, in increasing the climate crisis. You know, so that's what we do. We stop these emissions. We stop by whenever they, whenever it's profitable to do it, 2040, whatever, and and it's going to stop the uh, the increase in the in the in the climate crisis. But is that is a climate crisis right now? What are you talking about? You're going to stop that? You can't. It's here. We are in a climate crisis. People can't live where they where they normally live. So we need a restructuring of the societies in which we live to be able to sustain ourselves and survive. There's no way capitalism is going to do that. You know, check it out. Deal with this. There's no way. And what happened in those technology and revolution things is people started thinking, opening up, and actually saying that, confronting that over and over and over again. And they confronted and talked about the main issue <coughs> that, that um, envelops all this, which is technology can be used to increasingly destroy this earth, and technology can actually resolve our problems if properly used in the proper hands. It can do that. And we'll, maybe we'll do this exercise a little bit later on, but we had this exercise where people just imagine what society is going to look like. Well, what kind of society do you want to live in? What, what, what are the components? And they, and they, so they come up with all kinds of craziness. We write it down on the board. <coughs> 15 minutes or something like that. At the end of 15 minutes, we looked at the board. Every single thing was possible and feasible with the technology we have in hand. Everything. The society they imagine is a society that's feasible today. That's what technology and revolution uh, is all about as a process. So, um, by the way, people think that uh, the magical eight points, they're gleaned from about 600 points of unity that came out of the process. I know somebody's going to say, that you did not get, put 1,500 people in 25 sessions and get no eight points out. That, that didn't happen. No, it didn't. There was a process of, of, of narrowing it down and that uh, people went through. But the process was fully democratic. It was bottom up. I can talk about that a little bit later on. Um, and so uh, what I want to do... Is it, are you showing me what? No, I'm, I'm about, that's what I was about to wrap. <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, what we want to do is we want to have a, a panel discussion with my fellow panelists who will introduce themselves yet again. And um, then we're going to see what we can do with, with, uh, with our entire audience. But I think Emily's next. Hi, I'm Victoria. Uh, Victoria um, I'm sorry. No worries, no worries. I'm going to stand over here if, uh, if I can make sure this works today or this morning or this afternoon. Um, right now, it is not. Okay, but my name is Victoria. Um, I am part of the, it's called the Design Justice Network. Um, it is uh, working with a set of principles that um, allow, or, oh my goodness, <laughs> I'm getting nervous. Um, it's a design-centered process that um, incorporates or allows for people who are normally outside of a design process to be centered in that process. So most design processes have people all on the outside of that process and the people who are at the center of that process are the people who have the most money, the most benefits, the most privilege. Um, and so what design justice does is talks about and um, centers people who are part of those processes um, in the actual design of whatever it is. And when I'm saying design, um, I work as a graphic designer, so I do that in my own work. But design processes exist everywhere in the world. So it's whether it's, you know, building a new uh, building in a community or building a playground for an already existing community or building... 
um, technology and network structures, the things that we were talking about today. So it's centering people who normally are left out of that process in the process of designing it. Um, so because I can't get this to work, I can't visually show you the things that, um, that I'm um, going to talk about, but someone might be coming to help me. Um, so I've explained just a basic design process. Um, and one of the slides that I was going to show you is just um, around just some little dots that you would see um, where people who are left out of a process are normally the people who are most adversely harmed in a process and the people who normally benefit the most from the process are in part of that process. So if I used um, a technology example, for, for example, um, if we talked about Apple just and the new iPhone 11 S, J, K, blah, 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 whatever it is today. Um, if we talked about Apple and the development of their new iPhone, ah, here you go. Um, if we talked about that and we think about design as a process, um, the people who are most powerful are those who are like the CEO of Apple, or it could be the UX designers, it could be the people who are developing that project. Um, but we've also talked about how a lot of developers and designers and things are often you know, harmed in their process. It doesn't mean that it's a two-way street, that only people who benefit are only benefit and only people who are harmed are only harmed. It's two-way, that, that it can be both ways, but it's predominantly this is what you would see in a normal process. Um, and when you look at a process, this is the one I was talking about, um, this, the CN dots, the greenish colored ones on the outside are the people who are left out and the purple dots are the ones that are included, like that CEO. Um, and when I'm talking about design justice, I'm talking about centering those people who are most adversely affected. So if I'm talking about the Apple iPhone, people who might most be affected are the people who are working in mining where they're extracting industries to actually build the battery that goes into the phone that lets it power. Or I'm talking about the people who can't afford to buy that phone to access it to call their family and friends all over the world. Um, those are the people often left out of it. So how do we center them into that process? Um, and so we, um, a whole bunch of amazing, amazing people all over the world um, came together um, to develop a set of principles and they were developed over a couple of years. It's really hard for you to read that, but I just put it as a screenshot so that you could, um, there, there, there's some on the table over there if you wanna grab one. Um, and you can also read them online. Um, and you can sign up to those, to sign on to those network principles to talk about um, having those be part of the work that you're doing. It could be a useful tool in the workplaces that you're already in. Um, so just to give a little bit of history of how those principles came about. I'm trying to go really, really fast. <laughs> Um, so in 2015, um, a session was held at the Allied Media Conference. It happens every year in Detroit. It's really awesome, and I can tell you about it later if you want to know more. Um, but a session was held called Developing Principles for Design Justice. And what uh, folks in the room did, colleagues of mine, they asked people, um, they showcased a couple examples of various design projects. Um, some that would be classified as design for good or design for social justice. And everybody kind of thinking about that idea of, okay, I feel comfortable like myself as a designer saying I design for social justice, but that doesn't encompass all of the things that I'm thinking about when I'm doing my design process. So how do we um, talk about it using that word justice? Um, so what we did was looked at different projects. And the easiest example I can give is, um, uh, this project in Detroit was someone, like recently out of grad school, had developed a blanket jacket. So it was a jacket that could turn into a sleeping bag. And um, it was used and modeled, and in Detroit, it being having a lot of homeless population, it was used as a way to say, like, hey, now you have a thing to live in and you can, you know, sleep comfortably in the street which doesn't address the root causes of why that person or persons might be in the street or the industry that exists to allow for that to keep happening. Um, so we talked about that in this principle and we also looked at projects like that and said, 
um, ask who, who is being harmed, who's being benefited, who's involved in that process. And through talking about those things, um, then we talked about what, what would design justice be when looking at examples like this. So people came up with a lot of amazing ideas. Um, design justice is designing with instead of designing for. And then we do this by engaging our full selves in that process, becoming, engaging ourselves, throwing giant dance parties. So it was a broad range of a lot of ideas that people came up with. And then over time, um, two or three or four years, um, these principles came into this set of 10 that you can look at and sign on to now and use in your work. Um, but there's various meetings that happened, an editing process, and it's been a really encompassing project that now people can use these principles um, in their own work. And they also exist in some zines that you can get from our website as well. Um, I'll just read you one or two um, that for myself I really... Um, identify with. So we believe that everyone is an expert based on their own lived experience and that we all have a unique and brilliant contribution to bring into a design process. And we, de we share design knowledge and tools with our communities. Um, this is a very brief of how the network is, but I'm going to, I'll pass that over and you can ask me later. Um, I will just quickly say that you can uh, sign on to the principles or just go onto the website and use them in your own work, um, whether it's like taking it into your office and saying, I want to use these principles, let's change the way we're working to encompass more people in the processes that we're doing. Um, and you can also sign on to become a member. Um, and if you're based in Toronto, the network also has local nodes that are growing um, so I'm currently based in Toronto, and so I'm part of the Design Justice Node in Toronto. So we're trying to um, connect with a lot of the different groups doing organizing work and not just jump in and say, hey, we're designers, let us take over your process. No, that's not part of it. It's, it's, um, we're, we're starting by just like talking to people about the projects that they're working on, trying to learn more about those projects, um, and then seeing if there's a way that we could use or help th with the principles or um, help w with whatever the community groups are doing to help change those principles, make them what they need to be. Um, and I also wanted to plug one other thing that, um, so in terms of the projects and the reasons that the principles came about um, was because we're seeing a lot of design for social good projects. And now that there are a set of principles, how do we use those principles and put, put them to action in the work that we're doing? Um, and if you take a look at num or issue number two of our zine, um, you can see a lot of examples of different questions that we ask people. Um, but another really amazing um, project that has come very much inspired by the design justice principles and uh, many other principles that have been developed is um, the Consentful Tech um, zine. There's an online zine that you can actually go on, uh, download. Um, and what we're using that for right now is to redevelop the design justice website to make it so that it's a consentful process for people to sign on to the principles, to be able to remove themselves from the principles and any of that work. Um, it comes out of the, I'm going to say the, the acronym wrong, but a Planned Parenthood um, acronym, I think it's FRIES, so Freely Informed, F -R oh, I'm so sorry, I've forgotten what it stands for now. Um, but if you, if you take a look, what we're doing is using that, that consentful tech um, process and the design justice principles to make it so that when people give us their information, they can easily remove it. They can tell us how much information they want to share with us, how much information they want to share in the world, and then how much information, and they have the ability to be able to remove themselves from it. Um, and they actually, the, the, the web team that has worked on it, it has been um, doing amazing work around it, and now they're just kind of waiting for funding to come in to develop it. But it uses a lot of the principles. And one thing I will say is that there are 10 principles. There can be 100 million more. But um, each project that you do doesn't always have to encompass all of them. But part of it is trying to encompass as many of them as you, as you can. 
Um, so I will give you that link again, and then the Toronto link node, and then if you want to go and see the slides, you can take a look. I left a link for you to read them. Thank you. I also have slides, so I'm going to... Alrighty, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lorraine, and I'm one of the co-organizers and co-founders of Intersectio. So we're um, a BIPOC tech community. So that's a tech community for folks who identify as Black, Indigenous, uh, or people of color here in Toronto. Um, and we're both an online space and an in-person community where uh, BIPOC folks, racialized folks, can find opportunities and collaborators, um, exchange knowledge and resources, uh, cultivate like practical tech skills, um, like form friendships, <laughs> build relationships, build community, um, as well as hold like political critical discussions about technology. So related to both of what um, the other panelists have spoken about, like tech has disproportionate effects on communities of color, just in terms of like surveillance. Um, amplifying existing inequities and having like a safer space for folks who are racialized to talk about these things. Um, because as most of you are all familiar with, the tech space can be super white, uh, even in progressive tech spaces such as this conference. Um, if you look around, we can see that there isn't necessarily a ton of racial diversity. Um, so this can be really alienating uh, for a lot of BIPOC folks. So our goal was to create the sort of dedicated space that is specifically for uh, folks who are black, indigenous, and people of color to be able to um, like vent about their workspaces, but also like build community, build strategies, um, and also have more just like, yeah, critical discussions around, around tech, critical and like political discussions. Um, so just to give an idea of what we do, we're a pretty informal and small group. We've only been around I, I don't think it's that long, for two years, uh, since January 2018. Um, and it started off as a series of informal um, co-design meetups. And me and my friend were Laquan, who's the other co-founder. We were like, hmm, maybe like 10 of our friends will show up. But we created like a little Facebook event and like 200 people RSVP and we're like, oh my God, we're not ready. Um, but it showed that there was a lot of demand and thirst for um, like a dedicated space for folks who are BIPOC. Um, and we sort of use those initial design sessions to get a sense of what kind of values we wanted to embed, uh, what kind of programming people were looking for. Um, and we ended up hosting a BIPOC hackathon last July where people worked on community-based projects. Um, we ended up working on a podcast episode where we talked about the relationship that uh, people of color have with the internet. Um, I think the, episode, the first episode was called How the Internet Saved My Life. So also imagining um, how tech can be used for good uh, for our communities. Uh, we had a conference in February uh, around race, power, and digital justice. So we had a morning that talked about like what decolonizing design looks like, how um, what racial justice organizing looks like in the digital age, um, how tech amplifies like anti-black racism. So we had a lot of really interesting talks in the morning for that event. And then the afternoon was used to strategize and actually build concrete strategies for navigating um, tech workplaces. So we had a workshop around um, combating a performative diversity and inclusion initiative. So diversity and inclusion is like super trendy right now in a lot of tech spaces, including Toronto's. Um, and um, a lot of that we get the feeling is kind of performative. It's like a branding thing now. It's cool to do. Um, and we so we had like a workshop around how can we actually address how these initiatives can be problematic. Uh, and then we had another session around building professional power as BIPOC. Um, we also had an event in the spring uh, that was aimed to connect um, BIPOC tech workers to migrant justice work. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that later and some of the learnings that we had from that event. And then, yeah, we just have concrete events that are trying to help BIPOC folks get jobs. Um, we had like a building careers in tech day where we got people to come in, we took their professional headshots, we had like a workshop session around how to build a really strong portfolio. Um, we had like a peer mentorship session which, which was speed dating and people got to connect with more experienced folks in the, in, in the industry. Um, so yeah, that's sort of like a sample of some of the things that we work on. Um, I wanted to spend some time for the rest of um, my talk talking a little bit about our organizing principles. Um, the font has changed. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't expect this. Um, uh, so some of the unwritten principles that are shared amongst our organizing team for shaping how we think about our work. Um, again, we're totally volunteer, um, pretty small group, so we don't have a lot of formal processes, but a lot of um, 
values and principles have emerged over the last years in terms of how we shape our work and the decisions that we make. Um, so for one, yeah, we're a BIPOC only space. Our Facebook group, our Slack channel, um, all of our events are closed to folks who are racialized. Um, there are a lot of diversity and inclusion in initiative events already that are um, catered to educating folks who are white or folks who have more privilege. So uh, there's definitely value and a time and place for those events, but that's not really our goal. Our goal is to create like a shared space for BIPOC folks that's a bit safer, that's um, dedicated for us to exchange strategies and um, like share experiences and um, have what feels like a safer space. I, there's never like a 100% safe space, but it's like sort of working towards a space that is a bit safer. Um, we make sure that all of our events are free and as accessible as possible. Um, so from everything from like thinking about venue, uh, providing food, offering TTC tokens, um, hiring ASL interpreters. This was a like big learning curve for us. It's really expensive to hire ASL interpreters. It's like over $1,000. Uh, so for a community like volunteer group that doesn't have a lot of money, that's something that uh, we're really working on and struggling with. Like we've been able to provide it so far, but um, funds are running low. So uh, that's something that we're gonna, that I'll talk about a little bit later on as well. Um, another thing that we think about a lot is being really mindful about who takes up space. Um, under like the BIPOC umbrella, so even when you take white people out of the equation, uh, out of the out of the equation, uh, you still have a lot of power dynamics. There's still anti-black racism. There's still transphobia. There's still like anti-indigenous. There's still the poss possibility of anti-indigenous racism. Um, so we try to be really careful around how we curate our events and um, uh, how we like prioritize Q and A. Um, or choose speakers, so we make sure that, or we do our best to prioritize speakers and people who are black, indigenous, QT BIPOC, so queer or trans, women of color, disabled voices. Um, so just being mindful of the dynamics that are still at play, the power dynamics, even when it's um, a completely uh, racialized space. Um, we try to make sure to showcase community-based knowledge. Um, so understanding, yeah, that everyone has really valuable knowledge to bring to the table. Um, you don't have to be like a super famous with like a billion uh, Twitter followers in order to speak in front of a big group of people. Um, so at our conferences, at our events, we really encourage folks who are like first time speakers to share their experiences and perspectives and knowledge as well. Um, and then uh, the final thing is like being okay with moving slowly and moving with intention. So like, we don't have events every two weeks or every month um, because we wanna make sure that we're um, like creating a safer space and making decisions that don't harm people. And that means like sometimes slowing down and like having a big um, conversation with our organizing team and being like, is this actually like the right decision that we wanna be making? Do we wanna take money from this organization? Um, and a lot of times the answer is like, I don't think we should because um, we've heard that this company hasn't been that good to people of color. And we wanna make sure that we're creating like a safer environment for folks to come to. Um, so those are all things that we um, try to keep in mind when we're designing our events, designing our spaces. We're definitely not perfect. We're definitely still learning. Um, and yeah, I just want to spend the last uh, few minutes talking about some open questions that we're still working through as we um, grow. And I, I try to have a bullet point there where it's like, how do we think of growth that's not scaling? <laughs> um, because I don't really think that's our goal, but we're thinking about other ways that we can meaningfully think about like community growth. Um, so one of the big questions that we often ask ourselves on our organizing team is, uh, what does meaningful solidarity look like under this really mixed uh, BIPOC umbrella? Um, so for example, before every event, we always have a discussion around how we wanna do our land acknowledgement um, because we recognize that uh, different folks within like a BIPOC community will have different uh, relationships with the land. Some folks will be settlers, um, some folks will be forced uh, out of their homelands or their ancestors will, will have been forced due to like colonial forces. Um, yeah, maybe things like the, the climate crisis may have forced them to, to migrate. Um, maybe their ancestors um, were enslaved people. So there's so many different factors that um, um, cause people to, to settle on this land, and that's something that we want to take into account when we're crafting our land acknowledgement. So we've been sort of throwing around the idea of doing like a co-design session around creating like a shared community land acknowledgement. So that's an example of one of the questions that we, we talk about within our group. Um, other questions we ask are, yeah, how do, how, what are ways that we can think about growth that don't focus on scaling? Um, scaling almost feels unrealistic because we're also thinking more about sustainability. Um, like, how do we make sure we have enough money to keep 
um, running events that are accessible, that are free. We don't want to charge people. We want to hire an ESL interpreter. Um, we don't want to take corporate money. <laughs> um, so those are some questions that we struggle with. Um, we really want to do a better job at connecting with other grassroots social justice organizing. So connecting with movement work, connecting with activist groups. Um, we tried doing that with our migrant justice event. Um, and it showed that there was a lot of, we had a lot of BIPOC tech workers show up. We didn't have a lot, uh, as much representation from uh, migrant justice organizing groups. And I think it showed that there was a lot of appetite to connect those things from our side, but that we were still lacking the community connections uh, to do so. So that, that's something that I think we're, we're still definitely working on. Um, and the final two things are just thinking about um, creating some strategies for addressing um, group conflict, we run a Facebook group. I realize that Facebook is like evil and whatnot, but another lesson is like going where the people are. Most folks are on Facebook and it ends up being like a really practical place to organize and um, share resources and skills. Um, but yeah, conflict comes up, it's complicated. People are coming fr from different social positions and trying to hold those and recognize those and having a process for um, addressing conflict resolution. Um, and then finally, thinking about governance. We're like a small volunteer-run group. We try to make things consensus-based and non-hierarchical, uh, but structure is still like important and necessary. So those are some of the things that we're working through. Um, and yeah, if there are any folks in the audience who are, are Toronto-based or who are not based in Toronto but are interested in um, starting their own like BIPOC tech initiative um, in your own towns or cities, I'm happy to chat. Uh, we got this idea because we were inspired by a group called Color Hooded in LA, so in Los Angeles. Um, and they like Skyped with us and like gave us a lot of information around how they worked. Uh, and now there's another group in Vancouver called Tech and Color, uh, who we also like did a video chat with. So um, it's exciting to see like a lot of similar initiatives crop up across the continent. Um, alrighty, I'll pass it on to our next speaker. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Uh, in a completely normal and logical progression of events, we're now going to talk about hookers. <laughs> uh, my name's Ellie. I work with an organization called Can You Get Me If I Move? Am I live streaming now? Am I live streaming now? Yeah, okay, you're fine. So my name's Maggie. My name's Ellie. I work with a group called Maggie's Toronto Sex Workers Action Project. We are the oldest sex workers rights organization in Canada. We are very proud of that. Uh, we provide everything from drop-in services for sex workers, harm reduction materials. We also do like social justice and political advocacy work as well. And so I think that I'm here. Don, I'm looking at you to nod if I'm correct. I think that I'm here to talk about the ways in which we use like online organizing platforms uh, to further the movement for sex workers' rights. Yeah? Yeah, I yeah, am, too. I just kept hearing the word, like, BIPOC, and so I was just, like, looking around if people were talking. I was like, where are the black people? <laughs> where are my people? I was like, it's you and me right now, my friend. It's us two right here right now. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to consider when you have, like, gatherings like this, right? We love this language of, like, we're a space for black and indigenous people of color to come together and really, like, but, like, where the fuck are we then? <laughs> like, where are we? Come on. Um, back to hookers. Let's talk about, I think, like, the really interesting thing about, like, digital space, first of all, like, before you can even understand the kind of organizing that we do in terms of social justice and advocacy work, is you have to think about the ways in which online spaces have really revolutionized sex work, like, the nature of sex work in and of itself, right? Online platforms have allowed um, people who predominantly did street-based sex work to now access the internet, to access clients, to access sc screening processes and things like that, in ways that have sort of... I wouldn't say have completely equalized the industry out, um, but they've certainly provided space for sex workers who didn't otherwise have like the means or the platform to be able to do their work in the same way to access different forms of like safety and protection. On the other hand, sex work, depending on where you go in the world, in, in Canada in particular, uh, is still illegal. Or it's this weird thing where like technically sex work isn't illegal, but all the other things around like if we talk about sex work, if you give me money for sex work, or if we like do sex work somewhere, all that stuff's illegal and they just take your house and your home and your kids and all your things, but it's not technically illegal though. So it's just all these things, right? The laws sort of surrounding. So it's kind of complicated, but the thing about working in a criminalized industry then is that online platforms sort of allow us ways and means to do that work and navigate that form of criminalization. This is for some sex workers, not all obviously, uh, in ways that make that work slightly more safe. Clear? Are you awake? 
Are you alive? Are you with me? Are you still live streaming me? Yeah, you are. Cool. Um, so Maggie's is an organization. We operate in this really interesting place because like we, we get funding from the city of Toronto, from the province, even federal funding uh, to do work with a, population, with, a, with a population that is criminalized by all those same levels of government. <laughs> it's a weird relationship. Um, but often what we find then uh, in, in working with like criminalized groups like sex workers is that, you know, when... When violence does happen in our community, when people go missing, when sex workers die, when state violence is enacted upon sex workers in our community, there really aren't many platforms to like discuss that. And so the ways in which like digital spaces have allowed us to sort of address and to push back and to, and to I was gonna say a word that's not actually a real word, but to make more visible a population and a group of people that in so many ways, in so many spaces, are forgotten and are overlooked. That in and of itself has sort of revolutionized our work. So I will take you back to 2017. I'm looking at the time because we've gone way over time. 2017, in July. Uh, we have a weekly drop-in program for sex workers who come in uh, for harm reduction supplies, for condoms, there's food, we have fun. It's a great space. It's a build-up. There's a, there's a whole story coming. Uh, so in July of 2017, um, one of the women who, who'd come into our drop-in just all of a sudden kind of vanished. She stops coming in. Uh, weeks go by. We don't see her at the drop-in program. Her family and friends haven't heard from her. And so everyone goes to the Toronto Police Service and they say, listen, we haven't heard from Alora in weeks. This isn't normal. She calls us. She comes to Maggie's. We know, we know who she is, and this is not like Alora. Toronto Police, I feel like by watching your faces, you know where I'm going with this story already, but I'm still having some fun with it just to like build the narrative. Uh, Toronto Police say, listen, you know, Alora, well, Alora is like a sex worker, right? And like, not only is Alora a sex worker, uh, Alora is also homeless as well. And so like, you don't actually know whether or not she's like missing. Like she could have just gone to go sleep under like a different bridge. And you, you just, you've no way of knowing that, right? And so between July of 2017 and November of 2017, the Toronto police, they refused to file a missing persons report between July and November of 2017. Right, and I just like, I, I don't know if I need to say that this in this space, but just because there's like a lot of white people in this space, I just feel the need to really drive home the fact that if Laura Wells, a black and indigenous trans woman doing sex work, if Laura Wells would have been some pretty cis white girl in college at the University of Toronto, that wouldn't have been the response from the Toronto police. Between July and November of 2017, Every single week, no contact, no contact with friends and family, not coming into drop-in spaces. This isn't normal. We know this isn't normal. The institutions of the state don't care. And so what we did, as after months go by, sort of recognizing that like, okay, it doesn't matter what division of the police we go to, it doesn't matter like who within like any one of our like community partners we go to within like the city of Toronto or like local government, it doesn't matter who we talk to, they don't fucking care. Uh, so we organized our own search parties and we made use of like digital platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and online platforms instead to say, listen, well, if you Toronto police, and if you're not from Toronto, just so you understand the politics of the Toronto police, uh, this, is, this is like the agency within the city of Toronto's budget that gets the most funding out of any other resource in this city. They have over a billion dollars in their operating budget. So if you as the Toronto police with your billion dollar budget won't go looking for a Laura Wells, fuck you, we will. And we're gonna make use of every single digital tool and resource that we can to put her face out there publicly. If you don't care about Alora Wells, we will show that we care about Alora Wells. And so we put her image everywhere. We put it out as far as we possibly could. We tried to go to the media with it as much as we could. We made use of like digital platforms because you know it's not as if CBC is like banging down the door of sex workers' rights organizations to be like, tell us what you think about the current political climate and sex work. They don't care, right? But the way that like the, the digital platform can be used to sort of like equalize and provide an extra platform for communities that are previously like erased and invisibilized, right? And so we did that. 
And we ran a media campaign that shamed the Toronto police into finally opening an investigation into Allura Wells. That was only after weeks and weeks of organizing search parties, literally like combing the Rosedale Valley. If you're from Toronto and kind of know the Rosedale Valley, like a uh, uh, very like steep sort of cliffs, like a lot of like trees and shrubs and things like that. Not a pretty place to have to go and search, right? But like community search parties of like 20, 30, 40, 50 people over time. We did it every single Saturday in 2017 from November on, right? We started the first week with three people and ended it with like dozens, nearly 50 people, right? But the ways in which we were able to make use of digital platforms to shame the Toronto police. Because why is it that you have more than a billion dollars in your operating budget and here you have a sex workers rights organization and people that have no idea how to run a search party, how is it that it's on us now to do that work, right? And because of that public pressure, because of that shame, they finally opened an investigation. Alora, Alora had died, they found her body. We organized a memorial for her. Um, at Maggie's we started like a, we have like a memorial fund for her and we opened up a program um, for Two-Spirit uh, and trans sex workers in our community. But only because like a few people cared and a few people tried to make use of like alternative tools and resources to put her face out there. That's the only reason that that happened, right? And so I, I'm not gonna pretend that I do the kind of work that any of you do. I, I'm not gonna pretend I know the words or the language that any of y'all use. I'm sure that for the graphic designers and site builders out here, you make our nudes look real good. <laughs> so thank you. But you know, I really do think there's a lot to be said for like the ways in which like tools like, like social media platforms can sort of be used to, to put forward the stories and the voices of communities that aren't traditionally put out there. And so we were able to like organize a memorial and get closure for her family and friends and not only do that work, but to like create images and through like design work. And I just wanna like shout out my graphic designers in the room right now because of like the ways in which sex work is so often presented Right, like the, like, like the dead hooker on Law and Order SVU, although Olivia Benson, God bless her soul. Um, there are these narratives of sex work that are put out into the world that through like design justice work, we can change, right? We can create beautiful imagery of Alora Wells. We can create beautiful imagery of sex workers' rights organizations and people whose stories have often been told to make them look like victims and to make them look dirty, to make them look dead, to challenge those kinds of narratives. And that's what we try and do through Maggie's, although we, I'm not gonna pretend I have the skills that a lot of y'all have, and so that, like, all of that is so important, and I would really encourage you, like, leaving this space to try and find, like, the little, like, hole in the wall, sex workers' rights organizations to try and offer some of that help and services and skills training. The value in our industry of like digital security and that kind of knowledge, that shit saves lives. And so I, I don't know, I'm not gonna, I mean like, I guess I would say too that like in terms of like sex work and sex workers' rights organizing, like we're, we're everywhere. We're, we're in so many spaces in like social and political life and just because not everyone's like right up here and ready and willing to admit it, uh, doesn't mean that, that sex workers don't exist in your life. Um, and the ways in which our industry is criminalized, the ways in which we have to watch like our own people die, like our communities die, but then also like hide from the stigma from our own friends and family and networks, um, that, stuff, that stuff's really heavy to deal with. And so the skills that you have can make this industry safer. The skills that you have can tell our stories in much more dynamic and engaging ways. And you can paint us, you can paint our work as something that's beautiful. Um, the final thing I'm gonna do is just plug a campaign that we're working on now uh, for a sex worker named Mocha Dawkins, who's a, a black trans sex worker who's currently incarcerated. Uh, we're raising money uh, for her solidarity fund for when she comes out. Uh, her name again is Mocha Dawkins, M-O-K-A Dawkins, W-A-W-K-I-N-S. D-A-W-K-I-N-S, wow. <laughs> you can find more information about that online at maggiestoronto.org. We're always looking for donations and just to sort of like amplify her story uh, and her narrative. And I think with that, I'm done speaking now. I shall now consult momentarily. Be right back.
you people have you have questions, right? <laughs> All right, so we're gonna that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do questions. <laughs> oh, you're gonna give us fifteen minutes more? Yeah, if you want it. Yeah, um, so right. be right back. So what should we do? Oh, the moment. So we can give you. Let, let, let's just take the yeah. questions then, right? Because all right. Okay, so I'm going to um, moderate this question. Pay attention to the optics. You have a man moderating something and a group of women sitting here. So I, this, I, that's the way we, it was set up, so that's the way we're going to do it, but it's important to note that, I think. On the other hand, you also have a 70-year-old man and a bunch of people who probably their cumulative age doesn't even reach that, but <laughs> be that as it may, that's cool. So... Um, I, um, <laughs> I shall recognize those who, who raise their hands. And um, what do we do? We have a, a mic there. To any panelist or all, to whatever you want to do. Um, so I'll ask a question about sex work. Um, so there's a, there's a campaign by a lot of right-wing groups on um, outing sex workers on Instagram and elsewhere. And then Instagram would shut them off and Visa would shut them off. And, and the... Um, a lot of sex work lost from that way. My question is, did that campaign affect a lot of sex workers in Toronto or, or uh, in Canada? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'm going to ask a clarifying question, so you should keep that. So you're, sorry, you're saying that you ran a campaign against outing sex workers on Instagram? It, it was outing sex workers. It was identifying sex worker accounts. And it, it, somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Instagram and Visa would cut them off, including the money they had in their account. Um, and I'm wondering how that affected um, people in um, Canada and Toronto. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I thought that you said that you ran a campaign to out sex workers on Instagram. And I was going to be like, wait a second. Um, <laughs> So, I mean, I, I, I don't know about, like, that, that specific campaign, but, like, there, there certainly are, like, efforts to, like, out and identify and, and sort of sideline sex workers, whether or not that's through the, vet, the lens of, like, revenge porn and things like that, um, or even just through, like, basic, like, shadow banning for platforms just trying to shut down accounts because, you know, sex workers out here trying to poison the minds of youth with healthy sex education. Um, but I think that like this is sort of why I, I've sort of raised the idea of like digital security because this is something that at least within sex workers rights organizing spaces is still um, like fairly new, right? But I still, but I think like incredibly impactful, not even just in terms of like the mechanics of like how you put up a website and like how you go about screening and finding clients, but around this protection as well in terms of like being identified on social media. One of the things that we're seeing as an issue uh, at Maggie's more and more uh, are sex workers that are being identified trying to cross the border uh, and particularly as border agents can like take and sort of go through your phones um, or go through your bags and and see your glossy stripper heels. <laughs> it's very hard to explain that away. Um, but this is sort of like, in terms of like digital security and stuff like that, just being um, like the ways in which your, your persona and your platform that you do sex work through can be connected to who you are in real life is certainly like more and more of a concern for our industry. Uh, as was pointed out a few moments ago, uh, a lot of these uh, companies that are working on uh, projects that are most useful for uh, marginalized folks uh, don't have a lot of contact with those marginalized folks and tend to guess their use cases. And that's uh, not ideal and on, the, on a certain level somewhat insulting. Um, is there, do you have any thoughts on uh, how to address that in our organizations? Hire people of color? <laughs> um, yeah, like pay people for their expertise. Um, if you're doing like a design testing session, um, people are giving you their personal knowledge. That's something that should be compensated. So I think that's the first thing I would address, you probably have things that... Yeah, 
Go first. Go first. Um, yeah, a, a part of the problem is that there are strata within the technology community. Um, traditionally, particularly in the technology community that does movement work, it is still controlled by white guys, by white men. Um, and I mean, I can tell you this is a man of color. It's, it, is a, it is a difficult situation and a, it can be a very painful one. Um, that is, even if it's not what they want to do, they do protect that power. And so you, the way to support people in that kind of situation, the way to support white guys in that kind of situation, is to organize against that power and give them options. And so organization of people, of technologists of color, is a major, it's one, I mean, you know, it's what Lorraine and her people are doing, and many other people all over, and it's what we've been doing in May 1st forever, and it's the Radical Connections Network, which is this huge thing of techies, is predominantly people of color and women, you know. Um, and that, I think, is one of the forces that have to take place. But you gotta, one thing, and I'll be, I'll be quick, because I know that um, the, one of the things that you gotta do is you gotta change the dynamic between movement organizations, let's say movement organizations, and technologists. Techies aren't there. Technologists, designers, all those type of people aren't there to do the plumbing for movement workers. The, these technologists are movement activists, you see? By the same token, the movement people aren't there just to tell you one, two, three, and then you go implement it. They have to be involved democratically and fundamentally in the process of development of the solutions that they, that they gotta put forward. There has got to be a more seamless re, uh, relationship between movement activism and movement technology. Uh, and then when you do that, then you'll see many more technologists of color uh, having a voice and an involvement in, in, in at least movement stuff and technology in general. Did you wanna say? Yeah, I, I would echo exactly what they've already said. Um, and I think the, the, the consentful tech zine that I mentioned um, actually has some tips in it, which is basically what these folks just said, um, but also can guide you through like processes. So one thing that I've found in my workplace or like when I'm working on projects is just having kind of a set of principles or something to kind of go to and refer to and say, this is how I'm gonna do my work. And I know this morning we talked about how in a lot of the tech industries, like you don't have a union or you might not have different people on your team that can do that kind of thing. But if you find that one or two other people who are willing to kind of say like, hey, this isn't cool. Like I'm not gonna design this thing or I'm not gonna make use case scenarios around people who are not even in this room right now. Um, we need to bring those people into this room and that's gonna make our product or our service way better. It's gonna mean that the people who are gonna be affected by this are gonna be able to use it. Are gonna be, it's gonna be able to do the things that we need and you need to put funding in it now or you need to put resources in it now to make it the best it can be at the end of the line. We have other people though, so I'll get back to you. I'll do like a, a thing, a cir like a, a circular movement. Hi, first of all, thank, thank you everybody for sharing the work that you do. It's so great to learn about those projects. Um, I'm, I'm an artist and I do mostly uh, work like community-based work, social practice, and I intersect a lot with technology and urban policy. And one critique that I sometimes get, not consistently, but it's usually a lot of very well-meaning people, um, is that technology is not necessarily the most accessible thing for especially minorities or low-income people because, you know, literally it ex it's expensive or it's hard to obtain or there's some, I think, somewhat false but somewhat true assumptions that people, like, don't own a phone or something. Um, so in your kind of activist work, how do you address these 
critiques about technology not being accessible or like not being a practical thing to focus on? Okay, I might give a bit of a different answer just given like my area of expertise. Um, I think that, you know, the, the interesting thing about this question and, and I think about this a lot in terms of like how people think about like what sex work is specifically, right? When you think about like all of the skill that is involved in having to like document and market and advertise yourself. I mean, like the client care and customer relationships, but also in, in terms of like the back end too, in terms of like marketing and communications. So this might be a bit of like a different perspective, but like in my, in my experience, even just from like a communication sort of standpoint, right? Like black, indigenous, young people are such an incredible source of content. The shit that we generate like the artistic, the creativity, the shit that we're able to like put out there when you actually think about like the kind of like language and like lexicon, the images, like the, like the kinds of images that like digital brands are like pulling from, like they're pulling from our shit, right? And so I think that there tends to be this, this idea that like technology isn't accessible to like the poor and working class people of color when really it's like, no, that's our language. That's our slang you're pulling from. Do you know, like, I mean, if you even just think about like Vine and like, I know there's like a whole politics of like Vine and stuff like that, but look at the content that like went viral there. That was like black joy. That was like black magic and creativity, right? That like inspired all this really incredible content. And so what I would say is like, it's not necessarily like the, the particular like skill of, of technology work that is like not understood by our communities, right? It's the opportunities that just like aren't there. Or it's this idea that like what we do come up with is somehow just like separate because maybe we can't afford the same kinds of technologies as like professional developers. I don't know like the, the correct term that y'all use for that, right? And I think it really comes back to this question that was asked over here around like, how do we like, how do we make sure that we're not just like going in and asking people how to cater to more diverse people? Like, hire us, <laughs> hire us and pay us, right? And like, come, come into spaces and give young black kids the opportunity to learn the language of technology work, right? And if you do that, like literally, here's like, here, let me give you a tangible thing all of you can do literally an hour from now, right? To help address this and the question, right? Go back into your organizations, whatever organization or like collective that you work for and go ask them to bring on a black person. Go ask them to pay a black person. Go ask them to consult with a sex workers rights organization, right? That's how you like bring in the, those knowledges and those skill sets, right? The knowledge is there, the capacity is there, the capability is there. We're just not seen as capable by this larger white tech world. Rant done. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about sex work. Like I heard that like SESTA and FOSTA affects like a lot of sex workers in the United States. I'm curious, it's also like kind of effective in Canada, maybe, maybe in Toronto. Like, and I also wondering like if that's also affect to your online communities like dynamics. So um, SESTA, SESTA Foster, for, for people that aren't aware, there, there are two pieces of legislation in the states that are titled, very charming titles, like Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, right? I mean, then how can you be like, I don't support that. But really like couched in that legislation is a lot of language that like uh, polices and shuts down communities where we talk about sex work uh, and where sexual services are exchanged. And so uh, one, like, one major thing that came out of that was that Backpage.com uh, was shut down. And so Backpage, like sites like Craigslist, uh, were often used for people to go and like 
meet and find and also sort of like later on screen clients, right? And so uh, sesta Foster is obviously an American piece of legislation, but there are very similar tactics that are taken up in a Canadian context, right? And we can see that through like the shutting down of Craigslist uh, pages that, that people were doing and using for sex work, right? You can see it on how like when, like in, when, in terms of like policing sex work, often what happens is that like the online platform that is used uh, to sell sexual services, like the, like the website provider itself, uh, comes under fire and is therefore uh, incentivized to not even like include sex work at all, right? And yet it bleeds down into so many areas of public life, right? Like anything that like flags and polices the language of like sex and sexuality. Um, we've often seen, we've also seen this sort of like take and impact like queer communities talking about uh, sex and relationships as well. Um, so SESTA FOSTA, American piece of legislation, but similar tactics absolutely used in a Canadian context, and it completely devastates our industry. Like, when you do not have a platform to, like, screen clients, like, when that ability is taken away from someone, that increases, like, I mean, it just takes away your ability to, like, to further ensure your safety. So, completely devastates our industry. Um, I, I just have two questions for you. Um, yeah, about sex work. Uh, you used some terms that I am not familiar with. Uh, one was harm reduction. I'm, I'm curious to what that means. And also, you talked a lot about uh, screening clients. And in practice, what is that looking like? Like, what is the actual practical thing that happens, and and how is the screening done? Uh, yeah, just curious. So, a few things. One. I feel kind of bad that sex work, I mean like I feel kind of bad, but it's like a sorry not sorry thing that sex work is completely overtaking this because like y'all should talk about it. Uh, so the, the first thing is around this idea of like harm reduction. Uh, and harm reduction is like at, at Maggie's in terms of like our organizational philosophy, um, Often, as it relates to sex work, a lot of organizations that get funding to do like sex workers' rights stuff are organizations that are like helping people like leave the industry, right? And so you'll get, you'll, you'll get money and funding to help take people out of sex work so they don't need to do sex work and can get like a real job, right? Like, and this whole sort of narrative around like we're taking you out of this dangerous industry, right? Whereas our philosophy at Maggie's is like, well, one, no, sex work is like a legitimate and real form of work. Uh, but two, that the thing that our community needs to be able to do that work better are the materials and the supplies and the community resources to like help I'm trying to like find a way to work in the language of harm reduction, but to help like reduce some of the like the danger, right? And so harm reduction in terms of like handing out like safe sex supplies, right? As opposed to telling people like just don't have sex, right? Like sort of like reducing like the harm and the spread of like STIs and stuff like that, right? So harm reduction is just this sort of like approach that in so many other like industries as well. Um, exists so that like people don't have to stop doing sex work or stop doing drugs but are able to do those things in ways that are safer so that's the first thing and the thing around screening clients so when i say um screening clients i mean like it's this it's this luxury that doesn't exist for everybody in the sex industry but to be able to screen your client is to be able to like check their background to make sure that they are who they say they are. And that can happen through like a number of, of mechanisms. People get really creative based off of like the access to resources and technologies that they have. So it can look like everything from like um, only being able to like do and like secure work through like your work email address, right? Or having to like verify your LinkedIn profile or only accepting clients who can get like a personal referral from someone, right? Like there are all these ways that like you know, before anything happens, I can ensure that you are exactly who you say you are um, and try to like reduce the, like reduce the um, potential for danger. You're kind of nodding like, okay, cool. Yeah? Anyone else on screening clients? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah. So how can you find Maggie's Toronto Sex Workers Action Project? Uh, we are online at maggiesto.org. Uh, we're also... 
Oh yeah, how, how do sex workers find Maggie's Toronto? And how, if some of you are sex workers, can you find Maggie's Toronto? Uh, we do a number of things, right? Like we have this like weekly drop-in program, so a lot of it can be through word of mouth. Uh, another resource that we've had and also helped disseminate in the past is this thing called the Bad Date Book, uh, which is where uh, sex workers and people can report like um, bad experiences with clients they've had. This is predominantly for street active sex workers who like will recognize like a license plate or identify the way kind of someone looks. So you can take this resource and sort of figure out and determine like who you see kind of thing. And so I, I mean, it's my experience at Maggie's is that people often find our services. I mean, one, because we're just like a, an organization with like a web presence and stuff like that. Two, when they're actually looking to access like resources and supplies and services. Uh, but three, and unfortunately, just because of the nature of our work, uh, when things go really bad when sex workers need court support, when someone goes missing and the police won't listen, right? We're often that sort of space people come to to be like, we, we need help, right? So that kind of frontline work. Does that answer it? Can we just, is it possible, I just like, we, we talked about the fact that like diversity in the space wasn't like really a thing. And so like, can we just like, can we just like give one more question to my friend in the back over there? Um. No, no. Hmm? You want to talk about diversity in tech? Give people of color the time to speak. Let's okay, go. Great. So um, my question is connected to almost everything we were talking about. Um, this conference has been about it broadly taken, a question of centralization versus decentralization. And one key question I have picked up here is this value in, say, identification, talking about credible identification of what it is that is happening, but at the same time, you also need the spaces for anonymity and spaces for shadow zone because it's not entirely legal, but it's also not wrong to do whatever it's being done. It's just a state of the system as it is, as for now. And so trying to think through concepts of centralization, decentralization, from your work, how do we deal with that? Um, yeah. My brother, you need to clarify the, the question a little bit because I think there were two parts in it. Just if you could, please, and we'll try. Yeah, let me, see, let me say this again. So you have a platform that is centralized. Facebook, LinkedIn, Google, all these kind of things. And you have benefits to it. On the same side, there's the danger that these sites have brought, and that's why people are seeking to decentralize. How would you um, create a system that incorporates the two without necessarily taking away from something. As you say, the crisis, we're already in a crisis. There are two ways to do it. One is the technology way, where technologists, movement technologists actually go about creating the other, the, this thing. The other thing is a collaborative consciousness. It, it, there's a lot of reasons that you can use things like Facebook. There, it, it is an effective mechanism because they're are more than two billion people on it, two and a half billion people using it. Uh, and the same thing with the other Instagram and all the other stuff. There's a lot of stuff you can't put there. And you have to have a consciousness about using particular platforms in particular ways that are contributive to your work. How do you do that? You have work <laughs> and unite around it, discuss it as a movement, understand what your priorities are, and then apply them to the, to the, uh, um, you know, to, to these particular platforms. And you have had a lot of examples from the sex work. It does not surprise me that we spoke so much about sex work. We don't get to have com respectful conversations about it. So that's why we're talking about it so much. But that's what technology brings you. Because without the ability to tell those stories massively, that stuff would still be buried someplace. And you, that, is, you know, that is the intelligent and effective use of these platforms has to, in my opinion anyway, has to be politically driven, consciously driven. Does someone else want to say, and we are, now we're two minutes over, they get, it's that they're going to throw us out now. Um, but you can go right ahead. 
the the only thing I I would add, which just echoes what folks have already said, is like thinking about what you're making or creating or involving people in in the most kind of consentful way and thinking about it from a set of principles that you're following, whether it's the principles that the organizations that these both that these two both had mentioned and brought up, or what Alvaro had had said, but like thinking about it in in those ways and bringing that into your work, bringing the people into the work that you're doing and and making sure that it is doing the things that you want it to do. So sometimes that means you're using the big platforms because you, you, you don't have another option, like you're using it against the people who have built them. And sometimes it means you're building your own space, like some of the things that we've seen at the conference today or plugs that we've had. So it's like you have to balance both of those things and use them to the the way that makes the most sense for the community or the people that you're you're dealing with and working with. And then try to change them, like build them or change them to be more consentful, to be more inclusive of everybody who's involved in that in that group or process. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna cut it because at 720, I think that we turn into pumpkins, something horrible really happens. I think they get charged extra money and shit, some kind of crazy shit. Um, but I want to thank all our panelists. I want to thank the audience particularly. You make things happen. It's really, really important. We, we are very, very uh, grateful to you for attending and being so attentive and being so inter, uh, interactional with us. And uh, we'll be around someplace on Earth, the four of us. Back, yeah, Dawn is like, boy, where? We'll be outside. Meet us outside if you want to talk some more. We'll be around. Thank you very, very much.